Welcome back to Mortuary Mayhem, a podcast by funeral service professionals for funeral service professionals, where any day above ground is a good one. Today we're going to talk about suicide. Uh, This can be a trigger for some, so if this topic is something that you don't want to listen to today, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, Go on, move on to the next episode, and when you are ready, if you're ready, then, you know, please come back and listen to this episode as we are going to cover some great material today. But we do understand uh, that this is a topic that can be triggering. As a funeral director and embalmer, we encounter suicide frequently. Uh, we doesn't necessarily mean that that's what our decedent in our care died from, but we do encounter it frequently. And this could mean that this is the cause of death that uh, of the decedent uh, that we have in our care. This could be the family that we're working with. Uh, we have to fear that, you know, What are they going to do in the aftermath? Maybe they feel like they can't live without the decedent, especially if that decedent had a, um, you know, was a a significant portion of their day-to-day life, right? Uh, They may concern. And then we have to worry about mental health as well, you know, perception of you know, living without some, you know, without the decedent as well, uh, just the mental health in general of the family, uh, and risk factors of the like. Now, we are also going to encounter suicide in our daily lives among society. Uh, we're going to have this as a overbearing aura, I guess you could say, uh, within the funeral home as well, when families do come in and they do go to have an arrangement conference with us, they do attend a funeral, we have to be cur- uh, considerate, as uh, the word I'm trying to think of, of what were they there for the last time, right? People usually don't go to a funeral home very often, right? I think the average is around every, what, 13 years that a person actually does arrangements or is part of the arrangement process. And some families, obviously, as we all know, uh, frequent a funeral home more often for their family, and some frequent the funeral home far less. But we have to be considerate of, we may not remember what this person was there for last time, or maybe it wasn't our funeral home. And, you know, what is the emotional impact that this brings to them when they're in the funeral home, what does this remind them of and things that we may encounter? And they may not verbalize this. We may not know, but we just have to keep our eyes and ears open uh, and just always always expect with every family, regardless of, you know, what the cause is, uh, we have to be considerate of all factors of what, families come into our funeral home with, and what what is the stuff that they're not telling us about that's going on in the background that they may have that may impact their viewpoint of being there or how they behave or, you know, their thought process moving forward. Um, and, we, you know, we could go down a very long road uh, with some of those items. Now, what does suicide impact? It's This is not something that's just impacting that individual. This is impacting the family. This is impacting their classmates, their colleagues, you know, worker, you know, co-workers, whatnot. Uh, are they part of a group, right? Were they part of a sports group? Were they part of a, you know, an organization? Did they, were they somebody that somebody, that people always saw, right? This is the jovial person that was going down, running down the street, and everyone waved to, is this the, you know, what, what was their impact? How were involved were they? Were they part of a group? Uh, maybe they weren't. Maybe they were isolated. And, um, you know, that just because someone's isolated doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have an impact on a lot of people. Because they will. 
they will have an impact on a lot of people. And you're going to see post-death, you're going to see a lot of people essentially come out of the woodwork that whether or not the death impacted them uh, directly, it's going to impact them now. And especially after the death when we're starting to do memorial stuff and people are just like, I don't know this person, but I went to school with them, so I'm going to be there, right? And, you know, I'm going to jump on you know, and I'm going to join it. My I'm going to join my peers and support my peers. But again, they may have not known that uh, individual, so we don't know who is at the core of knowing that individual and who isn't. But do keep in mind that they are all impacted. Now, this also affects our greater community. Um, if this person's again part of a tribe or a village, uh, maybe there was a um you know, a small town in an atmosphere where everyone knew everybody, and it does grow from from there. Now, as funeral directors uh, and embalmers, we have to be considerate of how do we present this information. And I'm, I'm going to come back to this in a in just a, a second here, a minute. Uh, because how we work with our families can make a huge impact on the greater community and on that family. So this really comes down to telling their story. And let me re- let me come back to that in a second, because I want to cover some of the statistics first. I want to, I want to set the, the bar as to what are we really talking about today? So all this data is publicly available. Um, and the CDC is not, you know, is always going to take another year before they're able to necessarily get uh, the data completely accurate because they have to, you know, check everything. But right now we are looking at uh, so the so death data um, for about 2001 uh, is the actual uh, is the numbers that were last published. 2002 is provisional. It is out there, uh, but uh, for as far as trends are concerned, but not as far as overall grouped numbers. So in 2021, 48,183 people died from suicide in the United States. If you want to do the math, that is one death every 11 minutes in the United States that was a death from suicide. So that's that's significant. That is a significant number uh, if you put that into perspective, um, you know, by the minute like that. Of that, we have 12.3 million adults seriously thought about suicide. 3.5 million adults made a plan to die by suicide, and 1.7 million adults attempted suicide. Okay, so let me repeat that again. 48,183 people died from suicide in the United States. One death every 11 minutes. 12.3 million adults. That's just the adults. That's not children. Just adults that seriously thought about suicide. So, this, this has a huge impact. Now, the question may be, why did I randomly choose the month of June to all of a sudden discuss suicide? Well, part of this is if you look at the trends throughout the year, they're pretty consistent month to month. And a lot of this does have to do with different localities, different areas of our country. Uh, weather does play a big role in this. Uh, I want to remind everyone that I'm up in the Northeast here, but... With that, we typically see a spike around the month of May, especially in the more northern climates, the colder climates. Because during the winter months, individuals are in a more depressed state. I did not say depression. I said depressed state. So some people are actually uh, facing depression, and that is part of it. And then we have others that are in a depressed state. So while in this depressed state, we're going to see people make a plan, but they don't have the energy to follow through with their plan. So one of two things happens. 
We see people get it on their medication, and I'm not discounting medication. Please, under all circumstances, if you are prescribed a medication, please take your medication as prescribed, okay? It is, it is there for a reason. The doctor decided that that's what you needed to take. Okay. But what I am saying is that when someone first goes on a medication, they do need to be monitored, especially when we're dealing with uh, circumstances like this. They do need monitoring in the short or long term and making sure that we're not all of a sudden giving someone a boost of energy where they can follow through, okay? So, again, medication is good. Take the medication as prescribed. If you're not prescribed something, please don't take it. If you're prescribed something, again, take it as prescribed. But, again, uh, family, friends, we need to monitor, colleagues, you know, we need to monitor, um those close to us to ensure that, you know, now that they have the energy, um, you know, terrible things don't happen. And we have, but weather is a bigger factor here. And the reason we see May is the flowers are blooming, the sun is shining, and all of a sudden we all get a lot of energy, right? We all of a sudden get this boost, you know, first partially warm day and everyone's trying to run to the beach and the next day is freezing. So, but, you know, they weren't going to miss that opportunity for the sun to shine. So, all of a sudden this, these flowers, the sun, all of this starts giving people that boost of energy. And it takes them just enough out of that depressed state to all of a sudden have the energy needed in order to follow through with the plan that they've been planning um, for the last few months. So, again, we see a spike in May. This year, it's been brought to my attention, and I, again, I don't have national data. The data has not been published yet uh, by the CDC. I am just basing this off of local resources, local professionals in uh, suicide awareness and suicide support and hotlines. Uh, my colleagues and my friends have brought it to my attention that we are that they have seen a increase in attempts uh, and a increase in ideation, suicidal ideation, uh, this month, the month of June, uh, 2023. And they didn't see as many in May. And we don't know why, because month of May was beautiful. The sun was shining. The flowers were out. So. I don't have a rationale for that, but that did prompt me to think maybe this is a topic that would be appropriate for, for this month. So as we look through racial and ethnic groups, uh, we're going to see that non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska natives have by far the highest uh, rate of uh, suicide. And... Next is non-Hispanic whites, so 28.1 uh, out of every 100,000 uh, non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Natives versus 17.4 out of every 100,000 for non-Hispanic whites are affected. Those are your two highest affected groups uh, of individuals by suicide. Um, this is based off of 2021 data. So it does gradually go down uh, from there, uh, but any, as many, as much as just one suicide is one suicide too many. So again, it doesn't matter where you land up on this category. It's this is uh, this is something that affects everybody. We are also seeing a significantly higher rate of suicide-related deaths among males than females. Uh, this is not. Uh, attempts. This is actual uh, deaths that we are looking at in this circumstance. Um, I also want to place a disclaimer on this, that there are only two genders represented by the CDC. The reason for that is that this is derived from medical legal data. And when the medical examiner and the coroner are doing their data, uh, they are basing this off of biological gender, what is on the birth certificate. Uh, for medical, legal, scientific uh, purposes, uh, but they do respect uh, that they do respect that the chart could be larger. But again, this is based off of uh, birth certificate-based uh, data uh, for a um, for data uh, collection. So this would be 
um, also the ages that this does go across the entire age group. The entire spectrum of ages is affected by suicide. Now, the highest age group that is affected would be the 85 plus category. But yet, when you look at the top 10 causes of death, it does not show up for our 85 plus community. And it actually doesn't show up for our 65 plus community either. And the reason for that is because that there's far more ways to die when you're over the age of 65 than suicide alone. Yet, those groups have the two highest rates of suicide-related deaths uh, that we have by number. Not by ranking, but by number. The groups that have the highest by ranking, but they do have lower numbers in perspective, would be our 10 to 14 group. Uh, is Their ranking is third leading cause of death among that group uh, for suicide. And But then there's a huge spike in number between that and our 15 to 34-year-olds. And for that group, it is the second leading cause of death. Now, as we go across the entire age range here, um, we're going to see different trends. Again, again, doesn't, again, one death is one death too many. But as we're working with families, okay, you bring a decedent into your care, you're working with a family member, um, or someone at the arranging table, or someone in your calling hours during the week, uh, identifies that they may be considering ending their life, uh, and that is uh, another topic as well, is we're going to see for different reasons. And each age group comes with a different rationale behind why suicide was, uh, why, you know, why there was a ideation for suicide. So, with this, um, we also have to be considerate of all the factors that go around that, right? Was there blame? Is there survivor guilt? Is there a, maybe, you know, as we get into the older age ranges, we start looking at maybe, I'm just going to say the 35 to, you know, 35 plus group. We're just going to go with that. That we're going to see more divorce related uh, situations, right? Versus, you know, around that age group as well, the, you know, 35 to 44 group, we have people that are now, something happened, lost your job, you know, maybe divorce is part of it. Uh, we have life situations, maybe they lost a child and uh, that has impacted them. We have other life situations where you know, maybe they're trying to make it over that hump in life. That's what I call that. That that's a age where there's a there's a little hump in life at that point. And then we have our group at you know fifteen to twenty four. Where are you? Well, fifteen, you're entering high school. Twenty four, you're you know leaving your maybe your undergraduate uh, degree uh, in college. So, looking in this age group, these are people trying to figure themselves out. We are also surrounded by a lot of peers. You're comparing yourself. Uh, so again, these are not, I'm not putting rationales in anybody's mind here. This is just things that you have to consider of what happened and what do we say? What do we not say? How do we go about this? How do we work with this family and be considerate? And how do we honor this individual? Uh, but also keep in mind some of the things that may be going on in the background. So take a step back. I did mention uh, genders, right? I mentioned that males are far more likely to die from suicide uh, than females. Now, the reason for that is because, and as embalmers and funeral directors, we're well aware of this, that we're seeing more lethal means. They're utilizing firearms. We're going to see, uh, you know, hanging. We're going to see strangulation. Uh, we may see asphyxiation, you know, in a car. But we're going to see, you know, people, you know, obviously taking medications and whatnot. But males typically choose more lethal means than females. Now, 
part of this does come down to what am I going to look good in a casket, right? There is a underlying rationale here. Uh, I want to look good in a casket. Uh, maybe more of a feminine uh, thought process. But as embalmers, we all know that taking an overdose of medication is not necessarily going to make you look good in a casket. Okay, and again, I'm not going to try to get into the weeds here, but... Uh, you know, I do, you know, as a group of professionals listening to this podcast, you, you all know that what's going on is a chemical change when we're dealing with medication, when we're dealing with toxicities, poisoning, we're dealing with organ failures, we're dealing with, uh, let's say it was a blood, you know, a anticoagulant blood thinner, we're going to see a lot more postmortem staining, we're going to see a lot more you know, the effects of um, liver mortis, we're going to see, you know, all of that. So, does that necessarily make somebody look good in a casket? Possibly not. Uh, But we have, you know, and again, it may be easier to put together some minor trauma. Um, You know, again, there many of these cases, especially with firearms, where there may be catastrophic trauma, uh, where we're just not able, there's not something to put back together, but we do, but people out there are going to have a perspective, and they're in this perspective, they're perceiving that they're going to look good in a casket if they die by certain means, and we know that it's not the reality, so where am I going with this? Well, you got to work with a family, and as you work with this family, the family's saying, well, I don't understand, she overdosed on meds, so I don't understand why that she why she looks this way in the casket, right? You embalmed her. What did you not do? What did you do wrong, right? This is this is what's going to go through their head because that person in that casket does not look the way that they idealistically pictured that they should look. But we know what came through the door, and we know what those chemical effects are, and we know what got you know what happened, and they don't. Okay, in their mind, it was an overdose, they should look good. And this doesn't necessarily mean that suicide is the cause of that. We're also working with families where we do see uh, drug overdoses. And I know when fentanyl started getting leased into the heroin, uh, at least locally here, I mean, I went one day, I was burying, you know, it it seemed like I was burying cancer patients, um... you know, almost every day, and it was sad, but, you know, that that has to do with an environmental factor. We have a coal plant that did get shut down here, but those coal plants were uh, leading to cancer in our local area for years, and they still are, and even though they've been closed, it was, you know, again, people growing up like that in that area, but all of a sudden, a light switch hit. And all of a sudden, one day, we went from burying cancer patients to it seemed like I had two or three overdoses, uh, you know, every, every week. Um, it was sometimes four or five a week. It was, it was just an ongoing thing. And again, a lot of that had to do with fentanyl or car fentanyl being laced into the, into the heroin. But... With this, did the family fully understand what this, what was going to happen? If they came into the living room or the bedroom, whatever, and they found this individual, and again, I'm talking about opioid overdoses here, you know, and the needle was still in their arm, and the person overdosed, and I'm not going to get in graphic detail of what the person looked like on a public podcast here, but, you know, they, you know, the family sees that, and when they see that, they may understand. And when they see that individual in the casket, it's like, wow, you did a good job. Wow, I'm impressed. Because they know what that person looked like. Not everybody that came, but, you know, maybe the family that found them. So they may be, but in these cases, we, uh, people may or may not have seen this person. Uh, the effects may not happen right away, right? The person overdoses and then they have to go to the medical examiner's office and the medical examiner, you know, has them for a day or two, maybe three. Uh, then at that point, the family says to determine the funeral home and we know how the process goes, right? So the person's there for a while, they're laying flat on a table and 
now we're now we're seeing the effects after after the fact. Now, as we um, as we work with these families, we have to be considerate of how can we provide them the best service. And I'm not saying funeral service here. I'm just saying service in general. How do we provide them the best service possible? Well, there's a couple different things, and I'm going to give you the basis of how people, um, what people need first, is we have something referred to as the wellness wheel. And that wellness wheel includes mental health, family support, positive friends, mentors, healthy activities, generosity, spirituality, physical health. So these are all things that play a significant role in someone's mental health overall, their wellness, their well-being. And this is part of what can we provide this family? Can we make sure that they have the resources? If we're detecting that they need help, maybe we have resources in-house that we can hand them. Maybe we make the phone call that says, I think you need someone to talk to. It's okay to say that. I think you need somebody to talk to. I have a great resource here. Let's Let me help you set them up. Here's the number you can call or... You know, what would you be willing if I made a phone call for you? That's even better. Okay. Would you be willing if I made a phone call for you? We'll help you set up an appointment. Maybe your funeral home has grief support groups. Maybe they're specialized. Maybe they're not. Um, Maybe you have, you know, therapists that can, you know, that can help with families. And again, it doesn't hurt to provide this well-rounded, all-inclusive approach. But this also has to do with, again, making sure, like, hey, what do you enjoy doing? Encourage them to, you know, not just dwell in this moment, but to also continue. Do you enjoy running? Then continue running, right? Get physical health. Make sure that they're eating eating properly. Make sure that you're, you know, ensuring that people, when they leave your door, have what they need. And part of that does have to do with family support and peer support and positive friends. And how do we, you know, can we always control what's going on outside? No, but we can control what goes on within the funeral home. And during those calling hours, during that funeral, if you're noticing somebody is not positive, they're not feeding a positive environment, then yes, you can pull somebody aside and just say, hey, I need help. Can you, do you mind helping me grab something? This is people, these are, you know, one, these better not be your staff, uh, but if they are, definitely pull them aside. But I'm just talking people that are, visiting the calling hours and the funeral and attendees just pull them aside and just say, Hey, can I talk to you? And then explain to them, look, this may not be the time or place for this. And I know we may be worried about losing business and what are they going to do and all of that, but just pull them aside and explain to them that this may not be the environment and that, you know, you can ask them to leave, or you can just ask them, like, just say, look, I've I've heard what you've been saying. Can you, you know, can we, uh, um, you know, can be a little bit more positive? And hooking people up with mentors and, you know, making sure we can just say, you know, hey, do you have people in your life that we can contact? Because something about suicide is they are going to try to push their family and friends away. They may want them close, or they're going to try to push them away, one or the other. And... The reason that they're going to push them away is because they are afraid of how people are going to perceive them if they know that their loved one did die by suicide, right? It comes with a stigma. Um, They're in shame. They're embarrassed. They're, you know, maybe they feel guilty, some survivor guilt. Uh, Religiously, this may be seen as a sin, uh, so we have to keep that in mind. And again, when we're talking to them, we have to consider religion as a as a factor, right? How are they perceiving this based off of their culture, based off of their religion? And we can move forward with that. Uh, maybe they're disappointed. And uh, maybe there's a cultural taboo and all of that. So keeping all of that in mind, now we need to consider how do we help them move forward 
And part of that may be just asking and saying, do you have family or friends that that are going to help you through this? Uh, encourage them to stay close to family and friends. Okay, Encourage them not to push them away. Because, again, if they push them away, they don't have the support network that they need. But yet they're gonna, that may be their first knee-jerk reaction because people are going to ask questions. So that moves on to my next piece here, telling their own story. And we all know that if somebody doesn't have all the information, they're likely to make up information or they're likely to ask questions and then make up information. So this goes to anything, right? If If there was a mass disaster, if there was a genocide, if there was a water main break, if there was a fire downtown, I don't know, pick something, okay? And we get a lot of these things that come in through your funeral home where you can, tra- you can, hand- you can handle this all the same way, right? Can we give the information? No. We, as I always warn my students, I say, what's on the news is your life, Right? You hear about it on the news, and they're saying, you know, the gen- you know, behind me, you know, the uh, victim was shot seven times, and you're looking going, nope, 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 definitely ten times. The bullets were in the head, the abdomen, the shoulder, and the, th- and the thigh. And you know that because you saw that person. You embalmed that person. You know what's really going on. And you know the news is not right. But that's not the time for you to speak up. That's not the time for you to correct people. It's not to say, hey, you need the correct information. But at the same time, if people don't have information or they don't think they have all the information, then they start filling it in, right? So now people at home listening to the news are going to start filling things in. People, the newscasters, they have a, have a story. So they may start filling in information that they don't necessarily have verified or they may jump to conclusion. We hear people all the time, right? They jump to conclusion on how embalming may take place or how a funeral would be arranged. And you're looking going, no, I do this every day. And let me think. Nope, nope, nope. I know my stuff. This is how we're going to do it. Um, Okay, but this is what I do for a living, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I could do this. I, 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 I could explain this to you. But, you know, people come in, they think that they that they know more than they maybe do. But they start filling this information in. And when we're dealing with difficult deaths, this becomes a a problem because this is a topic where the family just wants their loved one passed peacefully in their sleep. And that's perfectly okay. That's perfectly fine. But if we start hiding information, I'm not saying the correct information, I'm just saying hiding information. If we start giving people very little, right? We start, we don't put the obituary out. The obituary is is very, very bland. It doesn't tell them anything um, other than the person died and it's obvious that there's information missing. Then you're going to find that whether or not we notice it, because again, we may handle this family for three days, they disappear and we never hear from them again, or maybe they're, you know, integrated into our lives here. But in doing that, we may see that people are going to fill in that missing information. So what you're best to do is sit down with that family and during any difficult situation, suicide included, and decide the story that that family wants told. And this goes across the entire service. So sit down with them, determine, okay, what, what story do you want us to tell? Do you want us to straight out say that this was a suicide death? Do you want us to give details? Or do you want your loved one to pass peacefully in their sleep? Do you want us to avoid this topic? How do we want to go about this? What wording do you want? And now we sit down with the minister, we sit down with all of our staff, and we explain to them. And we say, these are the words we're using. This is the story we're going to tell. We're going to tell this amazing story about all of this community service that this person did. We're going to tell this amazing story about how this person was in the choir or their youth group or, you know, how this person was a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout or whatever it is. This is the story we're going to focus on. This is the story that we're going to tell and we're going to stick to it. But we're going to give these people, and this is the important thing, we're going to give these people, these attendees, 
so much information that they have no room to try to add information. They have no room to try to make up information because we're going to tell the story our way and we're going to give them a big story. Uh, otherwise, what you're going to see is all of a sudden there's hidden information. You're, you know, you're sitting there in the hallway opening and closing doors, inviting people, you know, to sign the registrar book, whatever the case may be, wherever, you're, wherever your station is. And you're listening to family, your friends, chit-chat. What's going on? Wait, did you hear about what's going on? I didn't hear about what's going on. Did you hear about what's going on? And, you know, that becomes... A, puts you in a difficult situation, right? Oh, I don't know. I heard this. I heard that. And before you know it, people have made rumors truth. The other, um, the other thing is we have to worry about the ministers and anybody that's speaking. So they get up, and we've kept a consistent message right across the board uh, that the celebrant or minister maybe wasn't included in. And we have a consistent message. And then this person gets up, and they're, they've come up with the best poems, the best prayers. They're just going to, you know, they're going to speak um, about the life of that individual. And they say the wrong thing. They say the thing that we that was not part of our story that we decided on. So again, we want to make sure that we um, have a all-inclusive message here. The other factor is this may not be the best time for a eulogy or an open mic. We would discourage that. Um, I would discourage it at the funeral. I would discourage that. You know, in some cases, this may be appropriate, but in this circumstance, I would deter that. And I would deter the family from allowing any open mic at the correlation afterwards as well. Simply because we can't control what people say. We designate specific people to speak that are going to tell the story and stick with that consistent story. Now, something else uh, that we have to consider is even after someone leaves the funeral home, how is the family going to handle the memorial? Um, and I'm not saying what you provide for a memorial. I'm saying in general, the, li the living memorial that's going to go on for the next 10, 15 years, memorializing this person, right? The t-shirts, the, you know, walkathons, the trees that were planted, whatever the case may be. So in talking with suicide professionals, uh, it has been recommended, um, encouraged, strongly encouraged, that we not memorialize the individual's suicide. We can have walkathons, we can have memorials, we can plant trees, we can, you know, and you can still have a memorial for the individual. You can still, you know, you can still have a annual every year, you know, the person can have a memorial mass or service or whatever. I'm not saying that. Okay, still, you know, we still have services for the person. But this is when you have the outright, you have t-shirts and bumper stickers and things like that that memorialize, that we see this with any type of death. But now we're memorializing someone that did die from suicide. The concern that the professionals have is that we're memorializing suicide. That's that's their concern. Versus having these events to bring awareness. So now instead we have a suicide awareness. Stop suicide. You know, zero suicide, whatever the case, whatever your message is, t-shirts, a tree that was planted to, you know, as a memorial for stopping suicide. Okay, and that's, that's what they want. What their fear is, is a word we call contagion. And it's, contagion is not as big as we may perceive it to be, but the concern would be contagion... If we have other people at risk, could they see this and say, wow, this person was so loved after they ended their life 
nobody loves me right now, or I don't feel like anybody loves me right now, and I want to be loved too. So, again, that's what the professionals are saying is, you know, it's great. We can we can still memorialize the person with T-shirts. We can bumper stickers and all of this. But the message has to be zero suicide. It cannot be memorializing the fact that this person died from suicide. Um, but, again, that doesn't discount the fact that you can't have memorial masses or services or whatever the case may be because you can do that. Um, that's perfectly appropriate. There are a lot of great trainings. There's a lot of great resources out there for both prevention, intervention, and postvention uh, trainings. Um, as death care professionals, I would encourage that you all take advantage of these opportunities, uh, seek out these opportunities, and I am going to place some resources on the mortuarymayhem.com website so that way you can access those and. Uh, again, I would I would encourage you to seek these trainings out because whether it be a individual that died from suicide that comes into your care or whether it be a family member that's impacted by the death of that um, individual or whether it be uh, the risk factors of families and friends that do come to those services um, or maybe they don't come to those services, the risk factors uh, that we face with um, I'm not going to say that someone's committing suicide, or, you know, um, again, not, um, not that someone's going to die from suicide just because they're friended, but that does give an increased risk uh, factor. But what we see is we see people that are grouped, right? There's a common, people have something common, that's why they hang out together. So we have to be concerned with family and friends. Uh, that do come, uh, that were interacting with this individual, and do they have something in common uh, that may pose a risk factor? I will point out that there are a few things that you should keep in mind. Uh, part of this is, again, you're assessing, you know, again, we're not clinicians, please do not play clinician. Uh, please put people in touch with professionals. But you can be the eyes and the ears. And when you're walking around and you're noticing somebody during calling hours is presenting a certain way or they're talking about someone a certain way, maybe we can be the first person to say, hey, I have a number you can call. Because, and that national number is 988. Okay, that's the national suicide hotline. So have people call. Have people get help. Because Part of this is that they were just affected by this. Second, you're also working with individuals that on a daily basis are dealing with vicarious trauma. Just like the military, we see things that we would wish upon nobody to see. And that's just the reality of our job. And we do it very well. We carry that with us so that others don't. And that's our job is to carry a burden that so others don't have to carry that. And that is taking care of their loved ones when they die. Now, with that, be alert. Pay attention to your colleagues. If you're noticing that they're starting to present with warning signs, increased uh, alcohol or uh, medication consumption, uh, you're seeing uh, maybe that they're irritated, you're seeing maybe that they're drawing pictures or listening to music or uh, writing things that may not be appropriate. And that can not, these, some of these things can be very subtle, right? People have headphones on, so you may not realize that they're listening to certain types of music. They're drawing or writing, and you, unless you read the writing, you're not going to know what they're writing about and the picture they may be holding to themselves. So again, some of these things may be very subtle. You may not notice them. But if you are noticing that somebody is all of a sudden taking more medication than they than they used to, or you're noticing that someone's not taking their medication. That's the other thing. If someone doesn't take their meds, or that somebody, that could be two things. One, they're not taking their meds because their meds are keep, you know, are a medication that keeps them alive. Or they're not taking their meds because they're stockpiling those meds to take them all at once. Or increased alcoholism. Again, we know a lot of people that drink on a frequent basis. 
Uh, maybe that's their coping mechanism. Maybe that's just their lifestyle, whatever the case may be. So it's not that they're drinking. It's the fact that they're drinking more than normal when things are out of the ordinary. So again, if these do be aware, uh, be alert, and please get people help. Again, the national hotline is 988. Uh, you can dial that from your phone. I will place other resources on the mortuarymayhem.com website. You will see that on our resources page. And uh, you can find a lot of resources that I will uh, bring, that I will make available to you. Um, again, if you have any questions, please do reach out to us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com, uh, and we can help put you in touch with the proper resources. Coming up in September 2023, September 29th, we will have the NFDA's Arranger Training coming to Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Uh, to sign up, you can sign up through the National Funeral Directors Association, or you can email funeral service at capecod.edu and the funeral service program will put you in touch with the proper links to register for that course. The course is in person on the Bridgewater State University campus hosted by Cape Cod Community College, and this is the National Funeral Directors Association training. Definitely something you don't want to miss. Uh, we have some great... We've done this before. This is amazing. This is a great opportunity uh, to take advantage of and get this training locally. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mortuary Mayhem. For links to information discussed during this episode, please visit the website at www.mortuarymayhem.com. Do you have questions, comments, suggestions for topics, or want to be a guest on the show? Email us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com. We should do this again sometime. <laughs>